and welcome to this special broadcast on Joy 94.9 for World AIDS Day. I am James Finlay. Right now in Melbourne, it is two minutes past one. In Berlin, it is two minutes past 3 a.m. And in San Francisco, it is two minutes past 6 p.m. In this hour, we are exploring what's holding us back and how we can get there faster. With a particular look this hour on criminalization. Please join our global conversation by emailing onair at joy.org.au. That's onair at joy.org.au. Or you can join the conversation via Twitter by using the Twitter hashtag joywad. We'll be getting to your feedback later on this hour, so make sure you get on Twitter on get on your email and get in touch with us in the studio. Our guests over the next hour include Matthew Wyatt, from Burbank University in London, and Mandeep Daliwal, the director of the United Nations Development Programs HIV and Development Practice. But first, we'll hear from Matthew Viat, who is a professor of law and policy at Burbank University in London. His research centres on the impact of law and HIV prevention and people living with HIV. In addition to his academic interests, Matthew has worked extensively in policy development uh, nationally, regionally, and internationally. Recently, he has done research in Scandinavia in, uh, regarding criminalization in those countries and what amazing countries they are. Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Denmark, beautiful places. Dean Beck caught up with him during the week via video link. We're exploring what is holding us back and how is it that we can move faster. And we're looking at criminalisation and how the impact of uh, the law has on both the HIV prevention efforts and on people th that live with HIV and AIDS. And uh, Professor Matthew Weirt is uh, an expert in this field. He's done quite extensive re research throughout Europe and he joins us. Matthew, can you tell us uh, your research recently in the, the Nordic countries. Um, w tell us about that and, and the criminalization uh, that you studied there. Okay, so I was uh, funded by the Wellcome Trust to do some research into criminalization and activism in the Nordic and Scandinavian countries. And so I was looking at the use of criminal law in Finland, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. <clears throat> and the reason I went to do research there was because uh, counterintuitively, perhaps, uh, they have one of the highest rates of criminalization as measured by convictions for exposure and transmission of any countries in the world, which is counterintuitive because in lots of measures, they are some of the least punitive countries in the world, and yet they have a very high criminalization rate. Well, I think there are lots of uh, reasons for this. The uh, most compelling reason, in, in a way, is well, it's twofold. The first is that they have very broad criminalization measures. So they uh, prosecute uh, not only transmission and not only intentional transmission, but intentional transmission, reckless transmission, and also exposure and non-disclosure. And in Norway, uh, until very recently, where they've been looking at uh, changing the law, they haven't even allowed uh, the consent of a partner to operate as a defence uh, if there is an exposure allegation or transmission is proven. Why was that? Uh, well, obviously, one of the things that's very difficult in this area is that uh, criminal laws differ in, in all countries, and so you can't generalise. But uh, in the uh, Western or Northern tradition, it's, it, it is quite often the case that you can consent to the risk of harm you can't always consent to the deliberate harming of yourself. Um, but if you take a concrete example, uh, if you don't allow somebody uh, living with HIV to have, uh, have sex which carries the risk of transmission with a partner who knows uh, the risk they're going into, in effect, you make it a criminal offence if a serodiscordant couple, if a couple where one is positive and one is negative, want to have a child, for example, it would be a criminal offence to try and have a child if one of them was HIV positive and the other one wasn't, uh, uh, if you didn't allow the consent of the negative partner to operate as a defence. Is that uh, along the lines of uh, you can't 
consent to a criminal act being brought upon yourself? Yeah, I think we have to be very, very clear. I, I think there are two there are two stories here. There's a kind of moral and an ethical story, and then there's a legal and uh, specifically criminal law story here. So while many people, perhaps most people, would argue that uh, people have a moral obligation to care for themselves and to care for their partners, uh, and that, that's across all areas of intimate and other life, the use of the criminal law as a way of shoring that up is a much more contentious argument. So uh, the use of the criminal law to respond to uh, non-disclosure, to exposure and to non-intentional transmission is a way of using the law in the service, if you like, of public health quite often. That's the way that it's uh, expressed, certainly in the Nordic countries I was talking about earlier and elsewhere in the world. Uh, and yet there is no evidence anywhere that I have ever seen, which I have ever been shown, which shows that the use of the criminal law has any positive public health benefits at all. So the question then arises as to whether or not the extent of criminalization is justified. You might get people to agree, and this seems to be the position that's adopted by most international organizations, that deliberately harming other people with HIV is no different from deliberately harming somebody with a knife or with any other kind of agency uh, or, or, or doing it in any other kind of way. But uh, to criminalize non-disclosure and exposure where there is in fact no harm to the person, where they don't in fact end up being HIV positive, and even where HIV is transmitted, uh, where that's done non-intentionally, is an over is, is an over-inclusive approach. It's too extensive. And, and critically, and this is shown by uh, research that was done by the Global Commission on HIV and the Law, by many studies undertaken by UNAIDS, by the International Pled Planned Parenthood Federation and others, uh, that it contributes significantly to stigma and discrimination against people living with HIV, primarily because the stories which the popular media take up are criminalization cases. You very rarely have a front page of a newspaper which say, has a good news story about HIV. It doesn't say 99.9% .9 of HIV positive people are acting responsibly in their lives what you do is you get the headline of the extreme and exceptional case where there is an allegation of exposure or non-disclosure or transmission. And that becomes part of the uh, popular conception about, about HIV and about people living with HIV. that They are, in a sense, a danger to everybody else. Is HIV unique uh, in this instance? Is it the only uh, transferable disease that is criminalised to this extent? No, I mean, again, if you look at laws across the world, you will find that uh, some countries have very general criminal laws and they, they prosecute HIV transmission within their general criminal law. That's the case in the United, uh, in England and Wales, where, uh, where I live, in my jurisdiction. Um, and then there will be some countries which have HIV-specific laws. And even where there are general laws, what we find is that HIV is typically singled out for prosecution. Uh, we have had examples of hepatitis being prosecuted, hepatitis transmission, and we've had examples of other uh, serious sexually transmitted infections being prosecuted as well. Uh, there have been examples of gonorrhea um, uh, convictions, but these are tiny in comparison. Uh, the vast majority of cases are around HIV, and there's a real paradox, if you don't mind me adding to this, which I think is very interesting, which is that since 1995, when uh, treatment became available uh, in large parts of the world, of course not everywhere, we find that uh, prosecutions are, have increased, convictions have increased since it became possible to live with HIV well. Um, and that's, that's a strange phenomenon in a way. What is the motivation there, do you think? Uh, it's no longer the uh, life-threatening condition that it once was. Uh, wh what's going on in, this, in that space? Well, I, I mean, I think it's a really, really interesting question, and I can't claim to have a definitive answer about this, but I think that there is 
uh, before 1995, people had other things to worry about than going to criminal law if they discovered that they were living with HIV. The most critical thing was to uh, ensure a, uh, a, as good health as possible with limited availability of treatment and, and support. Now, because you can live well with HIV, it's almost as though HIV, and this is something I think is true, becomes in the countries which uh, criminalize the most, which is to say North America, Canada, the United States, Northern Europe, some parts of Australasia, um, well, in, in Australia and New Zealand, it, it's, it's become, it's almost as though being diagnosed with HIV or knowing that you were exposed to HIV by someone is a signifier, if you like, of uh, mortality. Uh, you have to live with being somebody who is chronically ill and uh, you have to live with the idea of being part of a community which is stigmatised. Whereas before, um, before 1995, you know, it, it, it was just a ridiculous thing to think, well, I'll go to the police instead. Um, and, and, and it's also very important to realise that in, in all of, nearly all of the cases that I've ever seen in the context of sexual transmission, and these are nearly all sexual transmission cases we're talking about, uh, it's typically um, the moral, the story behind these prosecutions is breach of trust. They tend to be cases where somebody discovers that somebody has exposed them to the risk of HIV infection or they believe is the source of their HIV infection and they feel undermined and they go to the police in order to deal with the fact that they've been duped in a sense. If you discover that the person you love is HIV positive and hasn't told you that, uh, and you're not positive, but you've had sex which carries the risk of transmission, or you discover that you're positive and you believe that the person you're with is the source of that uh, infection, and you want to stay with them because you love them, you don't go to the police. The, the offence, in theory, has been commit committed, but it's only those stories where people feel as though they have had their trust undermined, which ends up in, in, in uh, the criminal justice process. And once again, we see stigma playing such an important role in uh, that vindictive motivation. Yes, again, I think the reason why people, and it just shows, you know, that people talk about stig you know, stigma associated with HIV being diminished over time. And I just think that this is not true. I think that if you were to, it, it would be a very good indicator of uh, the fact that the stigma associated with HIV infection had significantly diminished if we saw a reduction in criminalization cases because somebody who discovered that they were living with HIV wouldn't immediately construct that as a harm that had been committed against them, especially, and this is really significant, in, in countries where um, antiretroviral treatment and support and community services um, are, are available. You, you would you would think of it as having been something which is unfortunate, bad, not something you would uh, have had happen to you in an ideal world, but you wouldn't go to the law, you wouldn't press for serious charges, and the courts wouldn't inflict serious punishments on, on people in the way that they have. Tell me, what is your uh, wish list, ultimately, as we wrap it up? Um, is it decriminalisation? Uh, uh, what, what is it that you think would be a suitable framework legally? Yes. Well, what I would really like to see is, the, the, is governments engaging in evidence-based policy in this area rather than uh, pandering to populist uh, sentiment and rhetoric and not introducing any laws which, uh, have, uh, which are punitive against people living with HIV and that they repeal all laws which criminalise the non-deliberate um, transmission of HIV and all laws which criminalise exposure and non-disclosure. And we have seen some good work in this area. You know, the, the, there has been uh, an effort in many parts of the world to minimise the effects of criminalisation. It's a very, very difficult ask for a political party or an individual politician to stand up and say, in the next election, in our manifesto, we're going to decriminalise uh, the transmission of HIV. It's a, almost impossible to imagine that. But what you can do is you can work in the gaps that
that the law leaves open. You can exercise your discretion to prosecute more humanely. You can require uh, scientific evidence to be robust before you bring a prosecution. You can require expert uh, evidence and do uh, the appropriate phylogenetic analysis. So I think that what I would really love to see is a review on the part of states where um, public health departments, health ministries, justice ministries, criminal justice agents work together to come up with a rational approach to uh, the law in this area and to recognise that criminalisation does nothing to improve the lot of people living with HIV. It has no demonstrable benefits as far as prevention concern is concerned and has significant detriment in those areas. And if we are really serious about combating HIV, we need to recognise that HIV isn't a legal problem that's capable of a legal solution, but is a public health problem which demands a, a rational, comprehensive and evidence-based public health response. Professor, thank you so much for your time today and thank you for joining us on World AIDS Day Worldwide. It's been a complete pleasure. Thank you so much. All the best. Dean Beck there with Matthew Wyatt, Professor Matthew Wyatt from London. You're with James Finlay today on Joy 94.9 for World AIDS Day. If you want to get involved with the conversation, you can at joy.org.au or using the hashtag on Twitter, JoyWAD. Our next guest, though, is... Mandeep Dalliwell, and she is the director of the United Nations Development Programs Health and Development Practice. She has for over tw over 20 years of experience working on HIV, health, human rights, and evidence-based policy and programming in low and middle income countries. Mandeep joined the UNDP in 2008 and was an, uh, the architect and team leader for the Global Commission on HIV and the Law. Joining me on the phone now is Mandeep herself. Good uh, well, afternoon for where I am, but I don't know what time it is where you are, Mandeep. Well, it's good evening from, you, from New York. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Now, uh, I, looking at criminalization and HIV, it is so surprising to see just how many countries, over 60 countries in the world, specifically criminalize uh, against HIV transmission. It's incredible, isn't it? It is incredible. I mean, especially when you think about the impact of the criminalization, which is that, you know, it has the effect of really driving people away from HIV prevention and treatment. So on the one hand, we're trying to you know, scale up programs, get more people to test and learn their status and access treatment if they need it. And on the other hand, we've got legal frameworks which are preventing them from doing that. Yeah, it's it's like a uh, battles against each other, isn't it? And you'd think it that is, absolutely. You think mm -hmm. that the Scandinavian countries, as we just heard, there would be so forward with these uh, developments with HIV transmission, but it seems like they're uh, they're not just they're not there yet. No, I think, you know, I mean, the reality is a lot of a lot of these laws are based on they're not based on a rational assessment and understanding of the science of HIV. And I think that's part of the problem. Mm. I think there's still a lot of even 30 years into HIV, um, you know, and there's a lot of success. But there, the reality is there is still uh, there's still not very good understanding, particularly in the legal and policy field, about HIV. Mm, yeah. Uh, we've already got some, some questions coming in on this, which is incredible. We've got many uh, topics to, to cover during, in criminalisation, but if we, if we look at Australia uh, specifically, uh, we've got a message in saying that some states in Australia, uh, particularly New South Wales, there is compulsory disclosure. Is this appropriate? And how does this fit within criminalization of the virus? Well, I mean, I think, you know, I think disclosure is always a good thing, but I think disclosure has to be consensual. Mm, mm. Um, and it has to be, you know, um, in, if, it's, if a person consents to disclose, I think that's a very good thing. I, don't, I think willful, I mean, no one disagrees that willful transmission uh, where there is actual transmission of the virus is a criminal offense, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. we don't need special laws for that. We already mm -hmm. have laws on the books, yeah. um, which could which could prosecute those types of cases. But the reality is, is that 
that that kind of transmission where there's an intent to trans someone knows they're HIV positive and they intentionally set out to transmit the virus to someone else and that actually happens that is such a small statistical probability yeah. and evidence really shows that there's such few cases that it really does not merit uh, a specific response. Mm. And of course, it's always the responsible thing to do to disclose. But the, rea- you know, it's a chicken and egg thing, you know, we create so much stigma around, around HIV that people often don't feel comfortable disclosing. Yeah. And I think like when we look at the statistics, we do see that most uh, trans- uh, transi- transmission of HIV um, is uh, with people that don't actually know they have the virus as well. Exactly, exactly. So on the one hand, you want to try and promote people to know their status. On the other hand, you, you're creating and perpetuating even more stigma by criminalizing transmission. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, and in some places in the world, astonishingly, they criminalize exposure. So oh, you don't yes. even necessarily have to have transmitted, but the, the mere um, exposure of uh, whether you know your status or not is a criminal, you know, deemed criminal by some of these misguided laws. So there's a lot of work to be done in this area. Yeah, I've, I, I read that Bermuda, uh, it is in Bermuda, it's a crime for people living with HIV to have any sexual contact that might even pass any fluid, which is incredibly insane, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. And I, I think this is the thing. I mean, there is very, again, these are, um, you know, these are laws and policies that are not based on, on sound, sound science, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and this is, you know, the Global Commission on HIV and the Law, which uh, UNDP led for two years. The main, the main purpose of the commission was to really drive home this point that good laws are based on Sound poli- you know, and sound policies are based on really good evidence and human rights. Yeah, and I think when when we look at criminalization in different uh, areas, like if we look at different key population groups, um, mm-hmm. so like men who have sex with men, women, and youth, which I think we'll all look at uh, in a little bit of detail uh, in the next half hour, but. Um, when, like, for example, sex work, more than 100 countries criminalizing against some form of sex work, uh, mm. surely that's, uh, promote, that's uh, encouraging more stigma with, uh, with prostitution, which then would lead to less people wanting to know their HIV status. It's, it's like a, a spiral, right? It is. And I think with, you know, one of, the, one, one of the things that's common to all of these aspect or different sort of manifestations of criminalization, no matter which population it affects, Mm -hmm. it is this, that by criminalizing, you are, you are in fact increasing risk, um, and you're diminishing people's ability to protect themselves from HIV, or if they're HIV positive, to effectively seek um, the care and treatment that anybody is entitled to. Yeah, I think so. When... It's counterproductive to prevention investments and to treatment investments. Yeah, I think when we see uh, the you know these stigmas and cri- well, more criminalization in certain countries against these key populations, then it drives people away from from health services as well, and those services just aren't there for those key populations, right? Exactly. Absolutely. And that's certainly what the commission's report showed that across the globe, um, across these populations, you know, uh, the, the, the fact that you criminalize um, actually creates yet another impediment for trying to scale up effective responses. Yeah, great. Okay, well, in the next half hour, uh, I'm, well, I'm st- I will still be joined by Mandeep Dalaval from the uh, UNDP, and we will be getting to uh, a lot more of your questions as well as, as we look at key populations with, uh, de- with criminalization of HIV, um, uh, well, people living with HIV. Uh, you can get involved via the internet. You can send us an email on air at joy.org.au or via Twitter by using the Twitter hashtag joywad. I'm James Finlay. You're listening to Joy 94.9. And it is World AIDS Day, December the 1st. So stay with us for the next half hour. We'll stay with us for the whole day. I'm James Finlay. We'll be back after this. This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. 
I'm James Finlay. You are tuned to Joy 94.9. You can also uh, watch me, actually, <laughs> via the internet, uh, worldaidsdayworldwide.org. Uh, you can get involved with the conversation with uh, email on air at joy.org.au or via Twitter using the hashtag JoyWAD. On the line, live from New York, I'm joined by Mandeep Dalaval, uh, part uh, of the United Nations Development Program. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, now, we've got a couple of questions in uh, via our listeners. Uh, one of them says, My partner and I, Sarah Discordant, recently decided not to travel to Dubai due to their criminalisation. How do we push for change? Well, I think, you know, this is in, uh, the travel restrictions against people living with HIV um, are now, you know, demonstrated, you know, through the work of the Global Commission on HIV and the law and the UN system to be bad public health policy. And I think we just need to continue to really push countries to change their laws and policies based on the evidence base, which now exists, that criminalizing uh, does not achieve any public health objective of any kind. Um, and actually is counterproductive to public health objectives. And, and it's, a, you know, it's a global effort. There's, there is some progress we've seen over the last couple of years, countries starting to um, look at their laws, assess their laws, um, and, and to try and change them. And we've seen a number of countries, um, you know, rescind laws on criminalization um, of HIV transmission or... Uh, because it's bad public health policy. So, for example, Guyana uh, reviewed its its laws and decided that criminalizing HIV transmission didn't make sense from a public health perspective um, and and did not pass that legislation as a result. Um, other countries are removing travel restrictions um, related to HIV, and there's been some very good progress in that area. Um, so we just need to keep, you know, sharing examples of where countries have, you know, have um, undertaken good practice in this area by decriminalizing, um, you know, showing that uh, decriminalizing or removing travel restrictions doesn't result in, um, you know, an uptick in, in epidemics and new infections, um, and hopefully trying to convince governments on that basis to to change their laws. Mm. But it, I think I guess it's slowly changing because the USA only removed their law in 2010, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, it is slow to change, but I have to say, you know, I, it, it is a bit of a sea change because, um, you know, for many years uh, there were a lot of us that talked about human rights and HIV and the importance of good laws mm -hmm. um, to support effective HIV responses. But certainly in the last two or three years, I think uh, one sees much more um, attention to this at the country level. And the reasons for this are very interesting. I mean, I think part of it is you know, people realize, okay, it's 20, 30 years of HIV now. We see, um, you know, we've used biomedical tools. We're, we're trying to use behavioral tools. We really need now to also look at the structural issues, the laws. Yeah. So I think there's more understanding that we need to address that part of the response much more. Yeah. I think there's also more and more good practice in this area, so more and more countries doing the right thing, looking mm -hmm. at the evidence, looking at human rights and um, you know, and adapting their legal frameworks accordingly. Um, I also think that, you know, we're at a time where we need to get the most out of our investments. You know, economies are, are suffering. The funding for, for HIV is not um, as much as it used to be. We probably will not see massive increases in funding for HIV. Mm. There's that much more pressure to be more efficient and more effective with our existing investments. And certainly the report of the commission showed this, that if you had the right legal and policy frameworks in place, that means ones that are based on evidence um, and human rights principles, that you could actually achieve greater reductions in new infections. <laughs> it's it's so funny to hear that, isn't it? So the an important tool yeah. um, that, you know, that we need to use. And I think that that's it. That, so I think, you know, things are changing. And I think, you know, for... For, for better or for worse, people are realizing that they cannot afford to ignore their legal environments anymore, that that's an important part of the HIV response. Yeah. And what is the UNDP uh, doing directly to, like, if you think about all the countries that do criminalise against, uh, against HIV, um, uh, people living with HIV, then 
mm. th- that's a lot of work. Where where do you start and how do you uh, get these countries involved in changing their decisions on their laws? Good question. I mean, the role of the UN, of course, is, you know, we're essentially a human rights organization. That's what our charter says. <laughs> yep. uh, we are a member state organization. So, you know, we are at the service of member states. Uh, we we you know, we don't tell member states what to do with their laws, but mm. <clears throat> excuse me, what we do do is we we do provide, um, you know, we provide countries with the tools to do the best that they can with their resources. So, you know, um, the report of the commission and the work of the commission is an ex- excellent example of what the UN can do in terms of compiling evidence, good practice, and sharing that with countries, providing them with the support to, for them to look at their own laws, to mm-hmm. you know, to work in partnership with the UN, uh, with different sectors of government, with affected communities, so working with people living with HIV to see, you know, what is the appropriate legal framework for the country. Yeah, I guess every country is a little bit different too. <laughs> no, absolutely, and I think you know the thing is that it, one of the best things one can do is to convene government and affected communities and for them to have a dialogue about the impact of law because i think often policymakers and and people working in ministries of justice are you know are rightly you know involved in you know enforcing laws implementing laws and sometimes they're not you know they're not so connected to what the impact of the law is mm-hmm. Um, at the you know at the level of an individual or at, a, at the community level, and I think bringing together communities, civil society, governments to look at um, you know in a very rigorous way, okay, what is the impact of this law from a public health perspective, from a legal perspective, from a human rights perspective, um, can be a very very useful tool in assessing and um, and serving as the basis for reforming uh, laws mm. relating to criminalization. We've got an interesting question that's just come in that says, that asks, uh, does the UN have active pushback from members against the UN work in this area? Sort of well, internal I mean, politics. There's all, yeah, I think, you know, there's always going to be different opinions. And I think what we, we always come down on the side of evidence. Mm. We always come down on the side of human rights. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, those are, those are difficult discussions sometimes. But yeah, yeah. I, I think... You know, that's the role of the UN. We are, uh, you know, our charter speaks very powerfully about human rights. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can imagine it must be difficult sometimes to, you know, get your, you know, everyone's got their own opinion in the UN, I can imagine. Yeah. Well, you know, um, and human rights are universal. That's and, true. And um, also, you know, evidence, you know, we, we, we base our policy recommendations on rigorous evidence. Yes. Um, and assessment of evidence. So I think you can't go wrong if you're if you're giving advice on the basis of human rights and um, human rights principles and public health and yeah. legal evidence. No, so. you're right. So I guess you're you are lucky in that sense <laughs> when you've got science yeah. and human rights and think, on your side. Know, there, yeah, there's always going <laughs> to be you know dissent is a is a good thing and yeah. you know and I think things only change through open dialogue and and, and of differing opinions mm, most definitely got another question that's come through on uh, on air at joy.org.au or perhaps it's via the twitter hashtag joy uh, hashtag <coughs> joy wad and it asks uh, should developed countries tie aid funding to decriminalization of hiv I, you know, I don't believe that that um, that conditionality uh, in aid really proves to be has proven to be an effective tool. Mm. Um, I think it's about building capacity in countries, strengthening institutions, um, to, you know, human rights institutions and and public health institutions to really um, understand the evidence and to, you know, build coalitions of the willing to, to reform laws where, where that's needed. And then, you know, in a lot of places, one of the things that we saw in the commission was that even where there are good laws, they're often not implemented or people aren't aware of their rights Mm -hmm. or they don't have access to, to justice. So really there's, there's so much to do in terms of strengthening capacity in governments and civil society um, across countries, even where the law may look good on paper. Yeah, I think that's such a good point too, because I've uh, I've been living in Germany this year, and I 
was going for a routine check and uh, the doctor said to me, oh, are you, are you really sure you want to know your HIV status because it may affect your travel plans? I thought, oh, well, well, hang on, uh, shouldn't... And then for a moment there, I thought, well, maybe it's better if I don't know because I am travelling and I don't want to be, like, knocked back at the border because I know my HIV status. But then I thought, well, hang on, let's just get a grip here and, <laughs> mm. and take a test. But, yeah, I think uh, also knowledge about the laws in, in certain countries is also quite important. Yeah, and it's important, and, you know, as you've rightly pointed out, you know, like, healthcare workers need to be well-informed, mm. and they need to be giving the right messages, you know? Yeah, that's right. Um, so I'm, I'm <laughs> horrified that someone would have asked you. I know! You know your status. That's I really, was horrified as well. Yeah, Incredible. Uh, that's a little shocking, yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, it just goes to show you the magnitude of the challenge in terms of, you know, people being... Um, being trained to, you know, to do the right thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If we yeah. just move topics a little bit, and I was, uh, I was doing some research uh, with in, on your website. I found, uh, in regards to women, uh, as with criminalization against women, in a sp in particular uh, Africa, Latin America, Asia, then the Middle East, uh, that early marriage and genital mu uh, mutation increases risk of HIV exposure. And I found that incredibly interesting, and I um I couldn't fathom how or why. Well, I mean that's that's down to pure biological reasons. So mm -hmm. you know, uh, the female genital mutilation, early marriage, young women are more susceptible biologically to acquiring HIV. Mm -hmm. um, so I that just you know speaks to the the increased risk of women right um in terms of criminalization of hiv transmission i mean of course the story in africa is very interesting because a lot of the a lot of the drive towards um having specific laws to criminalize hiv was ostensibly guided by people's desire to protect women from acquiring hiv so there was this notion that oh, all these men were going out and infecting all these women, so we yeah. have to criminalize that, and that would be one way of preventing um, or, you know, preventing uh, women from acquiring HIV. And in fact, you know, it, one found that that really wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. um, and actually criminalizing was having, um, you know, was actually having more negative consequences for women than it was for men. Yeah, right. Because of the, you know, sort of pervasive gender inequalities. So, again, you know, just goes to show you that you really need to look very hard at the evidence and to look at human rights principles to make sure that you get the law right around criminalization. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, you know, you know again, just to kind of reemphasize, because we often have to in this particular discussion, that it's absolutely... You know, I don't think anybody disagrees that to, you know, if someone willfully, intentionally transmits HIV to someone. Yeah, yeah. It's that, that is, you know, that's a, that's a criminal offense, absolutely, yeah. um, and should be prosecuted. But most countries have laws in place already in their criminal, you know, in their criminal codes, penal codes, mm -hmm. to prosecute those. Yeah. So having additional laws really just, you know, um, creates additional stigma yeah, exactly. on an already stigmatized, um, you know, health condition oh, and, yeah. and makes, you know, it just makes it more difficult to do your basic public health work. Yeah, yeah. In, in regards to youth, how uh, is, is it common for countries to have a, a law protecting or that mm, forces young people to have parental consent to get HIV tested? Yeah, I mean, the, the situation with young people is really very, very tragic, actually, and something that requires, I think, very urgent attention, because mm -hmm. we see from, like, the, some of the latest data from WHO, from UNAIDS, is that, um, you know, the, the rates of mortality due to HIV, so, or due to AIDS-related mortality, are actually going up in young people. Oh, that's incredible. So they're going down in, in sort of, you know, older segments of the population, but they're going up in young people. Mm. 18 to 24, um, you know, there's high rates of AIDS mortality. And that's because they're not getting access to services. Right. And that is because of these age of consent laws. And now often what we see in a lot of countries, and we found certainly found this in, in our work on the commission, was that, uh, you'll have in in this in one country you'll have one age of consent to have sex, mm -hmm. 
and one age of consent to access services, a different age of consent. So it could very well be that the age of consent to have sex is is 16. Yep. Um, And the age of consent to access health services without parental consent is 18. Oh, ridiculous. Um, And it's absolutely ridiculous, and I think it puts service providers in a very difficult position. Yeah, yeah. Uh, It puts young people in a very difficult position. Of course. Um, And, you know, and we're seeing the effects of it very clearly that, you know, you've got high rates of, you know, high rates of age-related mortality completely unnecessary. Yeah. And and yeah, go, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. And the the, the rates of infection of young people is is staggering as well. That's that's rising unbelievably, which is so incredibly sad to see. And you say that the the, that young people have a have a block from services, but I think one of the main services I think perhaps in my opinion that they're really missing is education, yeah? Yeah. No, absolutely. And I think, you know, being able to have youth-friendly services and prevention services particularly is critical, and, and there isn't sufficient investment in that. Yeah. Uh, did, your, did, the, did the report um, highlight anything in regards to sexual education that might be of it's interest? Very much so, and I think the report highlighted that, you know, there needs to be um, you know, there needs to be comprehensive sexuality education mm-hmm. for, for young people. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the law should not be, you know, the law should not be any kind of an impediment to providing that. Yeah. If anyone wants to get involved in the conversation, you can uh, on air at joy.org.au or on Twitter via the Twitter hashtag joywad. It's James Finlay here, and I'm joined with Mandeep Dalliwell, uh, live from New York, from the UNDP. There is one more uh, topic that I really found interesting and uh, find of one topic that I didn't really see that there was a, a right answer for, and that is with uh, HIV treatment and the and the laws surrounding uh, intellectual property of drugs. I find mm-hmm. I found that really interesting that uh, that a lot of the drug companies that were developing the um, the treatments or the you know the drugs that HIV infected people are taking to help with the with the infection. Uh, we're holding on to, you know, can I say drug recipes that uh, that would mm. prevent cheaper drug uh, companies from de- from developing their own. Uh, it's uh, intellectual property is always a, a tricky kind of uh, topic in any uh, area of the law, but in this one, it seems uh, a little bit more um, interesting. I think. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the HIV movement has really shown that, you know, um, public, you know, often that public health interests and trade interests and, and you know, and, you know, interests of, of private interests of companies um, are, don't always coincide. Mm. Um, and certainly yeah. what we've seen in um, in the context of HIV is that, you know, generic competition, so competition from multiple companies um, to produce the same drug really re- results in driving the prices down. And, you know, we need to, you know, life-saving essential medicines need to be affordable and accessible to the people who need them. Yeah. And so the success of HIV treatment today, we have 10 million people on treatment, um, is largely due to the fact that people have access to these good quality generics. Yeah, right. Uh, which are, you know, much lower cost than, um, than than what was initially being produced by the, you know, the R and D innovator companies. Mm-hmm. It's really, you know, inventors have a justifiable right. That's, yep. you know, without question. Mm-hmm, that's, mm-hmm. that's, you know, in, in international law. But at the same time, you know, public health interests also have to be balanced with that. Yeah, that's right. It's uh, it's, and yeah. Go. It's a really, you know, and it's a challenging situation. I mean, right now you've got a situation where first line, you know, the first line of ARVs are very affordable now. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've got a good number of people on treatment. But with the new WHO clinical guidelines, there's an increasing number of people who need to be put on treatment. Mm-hmm. The people who are already on treatment will eventually need to move on to a second or a third line because your body builds up a resistance to these these drugs over a period of time, yeah. those are still very expensive. Mm-hmm. 
um, because they're under patent and, you know, there aren't generic equivalents that yeah. are, you know, sort of lower cost generic equivalents available. So it's, it's a, you know, a looming crisis in that regard. Also, you know, drugs for things like multi-drug resistant tuberculosis and uh-huh. hepatitis C, which are, you know, sort of co-infections yep. for HIV, those are, you know, extortionately expensive. Right. Um, so how are you going to scale up access in a context where, you know, every economy in the world is struggling, yeah. in, you know, <laughs> pretty exactly. much to, to, meet pub- to meet public health needs in yeah. particular? Um, so how, you know, how without some kind of a um, some kind of a policy change in this area, can you really, uh, you know, scale up treatment to the to the levels that you need to to achieve? So, if you know, you want to achieve the end of AIDS, you need to let's say you let's say you need to achieve 80 percent coverage yeah. um, and sustain that. That's that's a that's a costly proposition if you don't um, you know if you don't make drugs more affordable. Yeah, that's right. It's a it's a kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of situation, isn't it? Well, you know, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure what how damned you would be if you don't. <laughs> well, you know, if the if the if the developing country if the de- developing companies, uh, you know, if if all the drugs were were cheap to access, then I guess the expensive ones. Wouldn't uh, the companies wouldn't get the funding that they need to put in more into money into research? Am I right? Well, you know, I think there, and this is the thing. I mean, this is the solutions are not uh, are there are a lot of innovative solutions which could be found, you mm-hmm. know, and I think which merit further work. And this is what the commission also said. You know, we need to look at, <clears throat> you know, absolutely the companies need to have the money to to you know, to do the the research and development work to develop new medicines and new treatments, and that's essential. But, you know, aren't there other ways of financing that? Yeah. Are there other ways of incentivizing that kind of innovation? Um, and I think, you know, there are things like, uh, you know, there's innovation prizes, there are, are research and development treaties, there's all kinds of different models that could actually be um, that could be looked into, which are viable for um, still providing the incentives for this kind of research and development work, but at the same time, not at the expense of making it available to poor people. Yeah. Uh, Mandeep, thank you so much for your time today. It has been absolutely incredible having a chat with you and your insight and the work that you've done with the UNDP just sounds absolutely incredible. So thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you. It's been a great conversation. <laughs> thank you. I'm James Finlay. Uh, you are joined on to two, Joy 94.9. Up next is Glenn Dalton with No One Left Behind.